As we conclude our study of Ezra and Nehemiah, well, you're getting ready to begin your study of Ezra and Nehemiah. Good Bereans, see if what we have said is true to the text, and I'm sure you're going to find some things as uh, you study that we weren't able to get to as far as class is concerned. But what is an application of Ezra and Nehemiah to a seminary student? Because you are seminary students. You are preparing for the work of ministry in the church of Jesus Christ. A ministry of exposition, but also a ministry of overseeing, along with other godly men, a local church. There are a, a number of books that you will read, that I have read, that are classics when it comes to pastoral ministry. Probably for those of us who are Protestants, uh, the first uh, and major work that we should read is by Richard Baxter, the Reformed Pastor. Excellent work, preparing us and reminding us of what, uh, of what ministry means for the church of Jesus Christ. Or Charles Bridges' work a century later, just on the Christian pastor. And I believe these two books are even required reading for your pastoral ministry class. And I think uh, uh, very rightly so. Another great work that you should uh, read as uh, preparation for pastoral ministry is the work by Spurgeon, Lectures to My Students. Thinking in terms of seminary students preparing for ministry, well, the good preacher himself, Charles Spurgeon, to his uh, preacher's college, to men of his generation preparing for ministry, gave his famous uh, lectures that uh, have been put into print. A newer work, uh, particularly dealing with uh, ministry that you should be aware of, probably the most impactful ministry of the, of the book of the previous generation, was uh, the book by Martin Lloyd-Jones on preaching and preachers. And uh, certainly since it's going to be a major part of your ministry, uh, you should take a look at that as well, and particularly the, uh, the 40th anniversary edition, which also gives testimonies to many leaders in contemporary evangelicalism and the impact that book had upon their lives and ministries as well. But none of those books, as I've reflected, is the most impactful book as far as my own personal pastoral ministry is concerned. The book that I found most helpful because of where I found myself as far as location and timing in ministry was the book by Ken Hughes, Liberating Ministry from the Success Syndrome. Now, I had grown up, as far as ministry was concerned, going to seminary in the late 60s, early 70s. And when I came out of seminary, the, the church growth movement had become the major trend, particularly here in Southern California where I was ministering. It was actually centered uh, right down the road at Fuller Seminary, the Institute for Church Growth. And uh, it started on the mission field and came to the evangelical churches, particularly of Southern California. And the idea was that if you would just follow some basic principles that had biblical foundation, biblical warrant, and you'd be faithful in fulfilling those, uh, those mandates, there's almost a sense in which God granted you success. It is out of uh, that milieu 
that Ken Hughes wrote his book. He actually had a church planting ministry here in Southern California in the, the late 70s, early 80s, and went into it assuming that if he would just faithfully put into practice the church growth principles, voila, his church would succeed and grow. And he went into a crisis when he faithfully did, and his church didn't succeed. What had he done wrong? But along with the church growth movement, during the 70s and 80s, particularly the Nehemiah portion of Ezra and Nehemiah became, as it were, the, the biblical blueprint for how to have a successful ministry. In fact, there was even a book called The Nehemiah Syndrome. I think, thankfully, it's out of, it's, it's no longer published. And I think because, like Nehemiah, uh, it's because probably the author uh, followed the quote unquote principles of Nehemiah and probably didn't have the stunning success that was anticipated. But this whole concept, and still, I think, subtly in our churches today, is the idea if we will just do everything right, the results are guaranteed. If we will just follow God's pattern for ministry success, voila, God is going to establish our church, give us growth, and we'll all live happily ever after. <clears throat> Reading and studying the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, I think, helps us to see through the fallacy of that proposal. Because, as we see, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah speaks about a new beginning, a fresh start for God's people, Israel. As God sovereignly allows a remnant to return from Babylon to reestablish a community in Judah, the city of Jerusalem, the building of the temple, the teaching of God's people that only leads to the city, the temple, the land at least having a measure of success following the pattern of First Temple Judaism during the days of David, who prepared the way for the First Temple, and Solomon, who built it. And yet, the same pattern seen in Israel's history before the exile, by the end of the book, becomes the experience of Israel after the exile. It was a new beginning. It was a fresh start. But when the story was told, the ending was exactly the same. Failure. Defeat. Not with a new exile, but with a community that would limp along for 400 years until the New Testament era, when the ultimate failure of Israel would take place in their rejection of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So that that temple that had been built 
and even enlarged and beautified by Herod the Great. And that city that had been reestablished be behind secure walls and gates also expanded during the time of the Hasmoneans in A.D. 70. That temple would be thoroughly destroyed along with the city by the Romans. So it took a while, but even historically, the new beginning ended in the very same ending. But even the book of Ezra and Nehemiah at the very end shows us that there is failure. Now, how do we see this worked out? How do we see this worked out in the book? Well, to simply refresh and, and review our minds of uh, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, we can see how in the first three blocks of narrative that we have the, the restoration of God's people to the land of Judah. And we have a, a pattern that it uh, develops. Ezra chapter 1, the decree is issued by Cyrus. Chapter 7, the decree is issued by Artaxerxes. Nehemiah chapter 2, a decree is issued by Artaxerxes again. The decree of Cyrus leads in the end of chapter 1 through chapter 2 to, to a journey from Babylon to Jerusalem. The journey in chapter 8, again from Babylon to Jerusalem. A journey again, Nehemiah chapter 2, from Babylon, actually Susa at this point, to Jerusalem where there is initial success. The instigators among the Israelites come to the land. Ezra chapter 3, the altar is built and the foundation of the temple is laid. In uh, chapter 8 of Ezra, Ezra brings the, the material, the vessels that have been given to him by the king, along with the king's edict that uh, is, is accepted and understood by the provincial leaders. And uh, Nehemiah is able to get stuff from the king's forest and again is also met as he finally lays out for the people what's upon his heart. They respond that they will arise and uh, commence again building the wall. But after that initial success comes opposition. Opposition in Ezra chapter 4, which will bring a delay of the building of the temple. An opposition internally by the problem in the marriage in Ezra 9 and 10, which uh, leads to a, at least to a delay of uh, Ezra's ultimate ministry of teaching. And uh, Nehemiah dealing both with external and internal opposition that he has to overcome. But ultimately, the opposition is neutralized in each one of these uh, occasions. And so there is final success. By Ezra 6, the temple is rebuilt. By Nehemiah 6, the walls of the city are rebuilt. And though the success doesn't come in this block of narrative by chapters 8 to 13, finally the people are taught. And in fact, uh, that merits a whole block of its own because the restoration of God's people by 444 B.C. is accompanied by the repentance of God's people based upon their understanding of God's Word. Now, the text is very, very clear through these first three movements that lead to the restoration of God's people in the land that will ultimately be in a secure city through the obedience to the Word of God with a fully functioning temple as God desired. 
And we need to realize that behind it all is the good hand of God, God's sovereign work. He is in control. He is the one who can move the heart of a king to do his bidding. He is the God who can direct his people. He can stir them up. He can move them to do his will. He is the one who can raise up good and godly leaders, both religiously and civilly, to be used to direct his people in the ways that he has for them. And so we, we realize behind even the success of these endeavors in the book is, is this strong hand of God. He is the final authority, is the final power. His will is the one that is established. And so there is restoration, and yes, there's this final success. And as I said, the, the ultimate success, the greatest success, the crescendo, the, the, the point in that, in that fourth block of narrative, what a success. The repentance of God's people the renewed commitment that they have to God based upon their understanding of the Word of God. Foundational, that is the exposition of God's Word, seen in Nehemiah chapter 8 through verse 12, leading to the response, the obedience of God's Word in 8.13 to 18, that leads the people to the proper response the confession of their sin and their commitment, their, their promise, their covenant oath before the Lord that their repentance leads to obedience and a commitment to follow the laws of God, the ordinances that God had given to Israel. And with this renewed commitment of God's people, the ultimate complete restoration of God's people, inhabiting the city of uh, Jerusalem, and dedicating the walls and celebrating God's work. And so we come to the last chapter of the book. We say, what a success through the sovereign work of God has been accomplished among his people in Jerusalem by the year 444 B.C. In fact, we're hard-pressed to see any other place in the Old Testament where there has been such success. based upon God's sovereign work through his faithful leaders among his people, Israel. Yeah, the second generation with Moses and then hearing Moses on the plains of Moab, his speeches and Deuteronomy and then following Joshua to conquer the land. Yes, the time of Josiah when the Torah was rediscovered Josiah's repentance leads to the reading of God's word and the tearing down of idols and the reestablishment of worship done right. So Jeremiah chapter 3 shows that though the heart of Josiah was swayed, the people went along with it, but their heart really wasn't in it. And when he died, they very quickly reverted back to their old ways. And the same thing it's true of the first generation under Joshua very quickly. We get to the period of the judges. And even here in Ezra and Nehemiah, with what seems to be ultimate ministerial success, Nehemiah leaves Jerusalem for a time, and when he returns, he has to confront the sins of God's people 
fact, if we see the renewal take place in 17 chapters, along with repentance and its consequences, in five chapters, by the time we get to Nehemiah chapter 13, the failure is extreme. How fast and how far the people had regressed. Within no more than 15 to 20 years, a generation, success had turned to failure. And yes, you can go through the, the passage in chapter 13, verses 4 to 14. They reneged on their commitment as far as the temple was concerned, providing for the priests and the Levites that they might continue to have their ministry unto the Lord. Nehemiah has to confront and seek to restore what should have taken place. Verses 15 to 22, when it comes to Sabbath observance, which again they committed themselves to, by covenant oath in chapter 10, there's a reversion, much trade and, and commerce was taking place on the Sabbath. Nehemiah has to confront the defilement. And even when he returned in those days, verses 23 to 29, there is once again in a marriage with foreign women that just like had taken place in Ezra's day, Ezra 10, had begun even in the house, the family of the high priest himself. And God has to confront that even though, uh, Nehemiah, even though there is no resolution. All he can say is in 1329, remember them, oh my God, because they've defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is not the fulfillment of the priestly covenant because the high priestly house is leading in this problem of intermarriage. And so Nehemiah takes it upon himself to purify the priests and the Levites and to arrange for the, for the supply of wood for the altar and for the first fruits that the temple might uh, in some way once again function as God designed. But all he can do is throw himself upon the Lord. And cry out, remember me, oh my God, for good. Three times, remember me. Don't blot out my loyal deeds, verse 14. Verse 22, have compassion on me according to the greatness of your loyalty. Remember me, ultimately, oh my God, for good. Nehemiah had seen enough, along with the post-exilic generation, know that God is a good and faithful God. That God was faithful. Faithful to His Word. Faithful to His promise. Faithful to the covenant He had made with Abraham. That had been seen continually in Israel's history as the confession of Israel in Nehemiah 9 clearly shows that in their repentance they realized that they were a sinful people. They were an arrogant people. They were a people who very quickly fell away from the Lord. And yet God faithfully, again and again in their history, had, had compassion and mercy that even though there was a disciplining hand, nevertheless, Israel remained. For that, Israel could be thankful. God was a faithful God to the Abrahamic covenant. And because of that, 
He had renewed the people. He had brought them to repentance. And in the end, just like past generations of Israel, they regressed, fell away from the Lord, and went their own way. Even what seemed like a change of heart, based upon their response, their obedient response to God's word. And Ezra and Nehemiah becomes, as it were, a narrative capstone to the Old Testament. A reminder that no matter how faithful a servant of God was to God and what success they might experience in being used of God among God's people, that in the end, the people regressed and failed in their responsibility to be God's people. And that pattern is not unlike what is seen not only in the Old Testament, this being the culminating narrative, but in the New Testament as well. The analogy is striking. The early chapters of the book of Acts. The gospel goes forth. The church is established in Jerusalem. It's met with initial success, but then comes opposition internally, externally. Excuse me, external and then internal so that the believers end up being scattered in the Jerusalem church is no longer the strength that it was. And think about Paul's ministry and how the Lord led him, enabled by the Holy Spirit, to preach the gospel, establish church after church after church. Within just a year or two, in Galatia, we'd have to deal with the Judaizers seeking to put those Gentile believers under the law. Within a year or two of leaving Corinth, we would have to deal with paganism now coming back in and being, being syncretized with the Christian faith in the Corinthian church. Or even the faithful church at Ephesus. By the time we get to Paul's leaving Timothy there in the early 60s, about a decade after it had been established, was listening to and being subverted by false teachers. And that faithful church that maintained a level of faithfulness, even by Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, Christ himself has to say, you've left your first love. I have one thing against you. Faithful in many ways. Gentlemen, Ezra and Nehemiah fits into the biblical pattern of Old and New Testament. That no matter how great the work of God, and no matter how faithful God's servants are to Him, that ultimately there is failure among God's people. Now, I know this is kind of a downer, which we wish to end this course. It's kind of a downer even when you're thinking about it in seminary. You, you didn't come to seminary to be reminded of the fact that you're going to face failure again and again among the people to whom you minister. But brothers, we have to face reality. That's the way it is. So the day is going to come when you're going to walk across the stage, you're going to receive your diploma, and you're going to go into God's vineyard to serve his people, called to a church to pass a call to a school to teach, called to a mission agency to, to evangelize and establish churches. 
but you can't forget the lesson of Ezra and Nehemiah. For every new beginning, there's ultimately an old ending. And here is the reality that Ezra and Nehemiah, along with the rest of Scripture, would remind us of. And that is, as God's servant, we serve. Yes, at times, a wayward people. Brothers, you and I will never be able to preach to the depth of Ezra, nor oversee with the ability of Nehemiah. And look at how God used them. Look at the look at the breath, look at the depth, look at the look at the impact of Nehemiah 8 through 12. It's almost like the kingdom had arrived. But sin had the last word. That ultimately is not success, but failure. And brothers, I think this is the lesson we need to learn. That as we serve God, we always need to serve Him with the awareness that our reward is eternal and never temporal. Yes, there'll be some temporal successes. As Rainier reminds us of that in the ministries that were given to Ezra and Nehemiah. But in the end, all Nehemiah can do is throw himself before an eternal God and say, remember me for good. Remember, remember me and have compassion according to the greatness of your loyalty. Don't blot out my works. Remember when finally... The temporal moves into the eternal when finally God's will is done upon the earth as it is in heaven. That's when the reward comes. Now, gentlemen, we still need to liberate ministry from the success syndrome. Let's not use the book of Ezra and Nehemiah to somehow believe if we do it the right way with the right motive, God guarantees success. No, no, no. We serve God in the right way with the right motives. And the reward will come when we stand before our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's remember that for every new beginning, sad to say, there is the old ending. And so, gentlemen, labor with eternity in view and not the immediate and temporal. This was the perspective ultimately that we see echoed in Ezra and Nehemiah. This is the result only we see echoed in the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Let's make sure it's that which is in our hearts, our lives, our service as well. That uh, we are not in it for earthly success.
we are in ministry for eternal reward. Sila, amen. Amen. Well, that's uh, how I preach Ezra Nehemiah to a seminary audience. Thank you for being that seminary audience. And um, hopefully it makes Ezra Nehemiah maybe a little more relevant to your life and ministry. Well, our time is gone. Had a great time. You're a great group. I look forward to reading. Um, I'll be getting in touch with Dr. Bedeboff, the uh, canvas. Uh, all the assignments are going to be laid out as far as date is concerned. Remember, again, you can uh, that, that gives you the ultimate date that should be in. You can get them in earlier than that. And uh, I'll be praying for you, praying that God will continue to direct you as you uh, study. And uh, look forward to reading your papers. I'll be on campus next semester, so you can always find me on Wednesdays uh, before and after class in Dr. Murphy's office. And uh, if you'll let me go, I can come uh, talk to you. And uh, So any interaction you want on your papers, I can also give it to you as well. Most women professors can't make that uh, statement the last 30 years, but I'll be around, so I'll be glad to interact with you. And uh, it's been a great week. Enjoyed each one of you, and uh, well, I look forward to seeing you around campus. Lord bless you. Great. Okay. Mm -hmm. And by the time May rolls around, I'll, I'll have those final uh, sermon outlines up for you, too.